top headlines for the week ending June 23. Eight-year-old Sophia Ladd found dead in a drain. Government committed to execute campaign promises. Murder gets 60 years, family decries the sentence. Tilapia rearing deemed feasible at Wales Estate. Welcome to MTV News Updates Week in Review for the week ending June 25. I am Trish Ramla. Good afternoon. An eight-year-old boy's lifeless body was pulled out of a train last evening, a stone's throw away from his home. The lad's family is blaming a neighbor for his death. Find out more in this report. Dead is eight-year-old Isaiah Smart of Block E South Sophia, whose body was found lifeless in a train. The young man was found face down. Mother of the deceased, Jason Pickett, says her son had gone by his sister, which was a few doors from where he resided. The mother believes that her son did not die from any illegal wiring, which may have been in the area. She got wired at all. She mother live in the front house where she does live, but she just deal with the thing at the back there. Smoke, cash, she like, and she can do, and she can do what she got to do. Following a visit to the area, it was observed that a house which is located on the plot of land does not have electricity to accommodate electrical wiring. Neighbors suspects that a woman who resides at the premises would conduct voodoo. However, Pickett says she does not want any problem with the woman. See, the one she never gave she. They are, yeah, the police are in the neighbor because it's right there, it's dead right by she, by the bathroom, by the back door. Can't tell the police when I was there, they say, right? They're not sure, they know if they give you anything for eat or all right? You understand? Nothing I could say, and I gave my mouth liberty, you understand? It's got to come to the yard, for go to the back, for go in the village. Sometimes he go to the front, sometimes he come to the right through there, he come and he left right there with the umbrella and everything in the yard, and he left right there. A probe has been launched into the matter. A post-mortem examination will be conducted on Friday, June 23, 2017, to ascertain the cause of death. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Meanwhile, on Friday, June 23, the post-mortem report revealed that the boy died as a result of strangulation. The woman who resides at the house where the boy was found face down in a swamp has allegedly gone into hiding. An Alboy's Tongue man will be spending the next 60 years of his life behind bars. He has been slapped with a tundra sentence after being found guilty of murder. Find out more in this report. Steve Alicock was sentenced to 60 years in prison for the death of Wendell Tappin in 2009. Alicock stood before a 12-member jury which convicted him for the murder of Tappin. When the verdict was passed down by Justice Navendra Singh, Alicock's father became vocal. The man argued that his son was wrongfully accused of the murder, even though evidence suggests that Alicock was not present at the crime scene the father lamented. In his testimony with me, he said a Negro man come up, take away the knives from every one of the person who he run in his son. His son get joker, give it to me. I collect the knives, right? His son still standing up there, his son ain't run away. He son stand up because his son is stormy. He said, well, here I stand, he don't pay for you, I'll kill me today. After the man gave me the knives, I take the knives now and distribute it back to me children. They're tell me children kill him. That's what he said. The stabbing took place in Alba's tongue when Tappin was involved in an argument with another man. It was reported in the media that the alleged attacker stabbed Tappin in his chest and escaped. Tappin was allegedly stabbed over a cellular phone battery. The deceased mother, during an interview, says justice has been served. Nine years, well, I feel that justice has to be Well, he then and he had a son, and then his wife was pregnant, and that child don't know his father. But he's very brilliant in school, and he's doing very well. Alicock's father and uncle were also charged for the murder. However, they were found not guilty and subsequently freed of the charge. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. A father is pleading with his common law wife to return home with his three year old son. He claims he returned home from the interior to an empty house. Here is Nikhil John. 
Sonny Lorenda of Diamond Housing Scheme East Bank Demerara during an interview says his common-law wife has run away from home with his three-year-old son. The man who visited MTV's office this morning explained that he returned from the Bagdam only to find an empty house. Lorendo added that he left for work approximately one month ago and would communicate with his wife via social media. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what she um, she gets herself involved with while I'm out. The man further added that this morning he called his mother-in-law who lives in Region 1. However, the woman claimed that her daughter was not there. If anybody knew, knew, knew where about of her, let, let them call me. I just want my son come home. I want, I want she come home. I want to see my son. Lorenda is pleading with his common-law wife to return home with the child. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The Working People's Alliance, during a recent press conference, stated that the APNU-AFC government did not hold consultation with the party in two years. However, President David Granger says the coalition government did not sideline any party. Find out more in this Nickel John to report. As far as the AFC is concerned, um, there is a, an agreement, and the AFC nominated the persons who are now in the cabinet. It had to be consulted. In fact, specific um, ministries were uh, agreed to in the uh, accord. Um, as far as the other parties are concerned, those are the nominees of the parties. Mr. Dr. Rupin Ryan was the prime ministerial candidate at my side throughout the 2011 campaign. He sat down in parliament throughout the 10th, uh, next to me, on the left hand, in the, throughout the 10th parliament. We campaigned together. So he was always seen to be and deemed to be representative of the Working People's Alliance. He doesn't belong to the PNC, he doesn't belong to the AFC, he belongs to the WPA. That was President David Granger in an invited comment on the issue. President Granger says he had the option to make a selection of ministers after May 16, 2015. He added that the selection was based on a commitment to inclusionary democracy and to ensure that all members of the partnership were represented. On the allegation of the Working People's Alliance being sidelined, President Granger explained that there is no rift between the coalition partners. I run a coalition and I do not attack my partners. Um, I have not expressed any concern, I am not, have not reacted, but I know where we are going. I know the importance of the coalition to uh, social cohesion and to inclusionary democracy and to the future of this country. I don't believe that the business of the coalition could be efficiently and effectively uh, transacted in the media, and I don't do business like that. The WPA, during a recent press conference, voiced its concern over the reassignment of its member, Dr. Rupert Rupnarain from the Ministry of Education, to a department under the Ministry of the Presidency. Executive member of the WPA, Dr. David Heinz, had stated that the meeting which was held between the president and the party's executives on Saturday, June 17, 2017, was fruitful. Another meeting is scheduled for July 22, 2017. The WPA executive member maintained that the coalition government did not engage the party in two years. Dr. Heinz, however, believes that members' opinion within the party has been strong to withdraw from the coalition government. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Attorney General Basil Williams has unabashedly rejected the damning email being circulated, purporting to have been authored by him, labeling it as fake. The mail sent out to the media speaks about the impending third term involving former President Barjack Dio and of interference with the judiciary. On Tuesday, June 20, a mail containing two attachments was circulated to members of the media, purportedly being authored by the Attorney General Basil Williams. The fake mail purportedly indicated that the AG was in conversation with the Minister of Citizenship, Winston Felix, about the impending presidential third term case, which is at the Caribbean Court of Justice. The mail alleged that Williams sent another email to several ministers 
about an action plan to secure victory at the 2020 elections. The plan allegedly proposed the reversal of some tax measures. However, the AG has distanced himself from the mail. Basil Williams says that the mail is another wicked and desperate attempt by the opposition, People's Progressive Party, to deflect from the recent exposure of its failure in the National Assembly. He said the email in circulation is not his. AG said that from his own investigations, the email address purporting to be his was recently created. Efforts are being made to verify in whose name it is registered. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. President David Granger says the coalition government has not failed to deliver its campaign promises. This comes against the backdrop of mountain statements by the People's Progressive Party and the Working People's Alliance alleging that the coalition has fallen short of their manifesto promises. Details in this report. The head of state claimed that the coalition administration is working progressively to address the various judicial appointments. As you know, we have done a lot of work uh, this year to ensure that the uh, Institution, the judicial institutions are well staffed, the Public Service Appellate Tribunal, the Ombudsman. One of the concerns raised by the Working People's Alliance is the establishment of the Local Government Commission. The coalition partner believes that the time has come for the commission to be fully established. Minister of State Joseph Harmon says they are waiting on opposition leader Bar Jagdio to provide a list of persons who would be considered to be appointed on the commission. Minister Harmon explained that the political parties in the National Assembly have received a letter from Jagdio requesting to meet with them on the nomination process. At that meeting, the representatives from the political parties met with him and they are working now as to how that list is to be constructed. So the wall is in, is, is in his court right now. Meantime, on the issue of constitutional reform, President Granger asserted that the process is moving apace. He affirmed that proposals were made in 2015. However, funding remains a critical element to start the consultative process. I think there's a question now of financing the, the process because we want to have a consultative process. But um, it is moving. It hasn't been halted. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu rebukes the efforts of opposition member Anil Nanlal to allegedly incite sugar workers. This is in response to the opposition member's reminder that Nagamutu allegedly promised to pay the sugar workers an increase of 25% to their wages. Find out more in this report. In a worded statement from the Office of the Prime Minister, it refutes alleged blatant falsehoods being peddled by opposition parliamentarian Anil Nanlal in a purported effort to incite sugar workers. The statement said Nanlal is reported to have stated that in 2011, the Prime Minister, then in opposition, had promised sugar workers 25% increase in wages. It added that this is a makeshift invention for which the opposition parliamentarian can give any proof. The statement further added that it is clear that Nanlal was allowed to run free against the Prime Minister after his devastating exposure of the Bar Jagdi regime for purportedly bankrupting the sugar industry during the June 15 sitting of the National Assembly. The statement added that Nanlal is resorting to typical vendetta politics in a lame attempt at getting at the Prime Minister for Jagdi's hopeless attempt to avoid blame for the crisis in the sugar industry. It said Nanlal is also peddling a huge lie that the coalition government had blocked bailouts for the sugar industry. On the contrary, the coalition government, even while it was in opposition, voted for every bailout package for sugar workers. Further, after taking office, the coalition government voted for over $32 billion from 2015 to 2017 to further help the sugar industry stay afloat and to pay wages to sugar workers, whilst it worked on a plan to make the industry profitable. The Office of the Prime Minister condemns Nanlal and the PPP for attempting to exploit the situation in the sugar industry by making it into a political fun game and for kicking the fate of sugar workers like a football. 
The statement cautioned sugar workers that they must not allow themselves to be fooled by political hustlers like opposition member Nanlal and must not fall victim to their desperate campaign of stirring racism and division. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. As the Petroleum Commission is likely to be established soon, the Minister of Natural Resources has come in for heavy criticism from the People's Progressive Party. The party's General Secretary, Bart Jagdeo, alleges that Minister Trotman will usurp the oil and gas industry as his powers will be endless. Here is Sandy Ramatar. Leader of the People's Progressive Party, Bart Jagdeo, says the bill signal that the oil industry will strictly be run by politicians. Noting the bill points to a number of deficiencies, Jagdeo says the industry will be controlled and dominated as the functions of the board are being usurped by the Minister of Natural Resources, Rafa Trotman. How large the minister looms in this commission and the powers of the minister and that this bill seems to be designed to give a particular individual, Mr. Trotman, authority to do whatever he wanted. This follows Trotman's behavior, which came after guidance given by the leader of the opposition on the imminent industry. According to him, Trotman's alleged livid behavior is as a result of his alleged lack of competence. The People's Progressive Party believes the government displays actions of tackiness when its alleged incompetence and lack of vision are shown. So he, he could not respond to the technical issues, so he had to descend into, into this matter and was allowed by the speaker and was allowed by the speaker to do it. But I have come not to expect anything else from the speaker. Following the passage of the bill, the Petroleum Commission will have the responsibility for ensuring policies, laws and agreements for petroleum operations are complied with. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The report on the feasibility study for aquaculture as a diversification venture for Gaisuku has significant potential. This is according to the Guyana Sugar Company. The Guyana Sugar Corporation prepares to look at a new horizon as the sugar production is becoming more unfeasible. It is due to this long-known fact that the coalition government had initiated a feasibility study for aquaculture as a diversification venture for Gaisuku. The study was undertaken by Aquasol Corporation Inc., a company that is based in Florida, United States of America. The study, according to the sugar company, concludes that, that aquaculture has a significant potential as a diversification mechanism. The study highlighted that Guyana's climatic conditions and soil types are ideal to support high growth rates for tilapia throughout the year. While the main products considered in the report were tilapia and shrimp, the report concluded that tilapia was more suited for the Wales Estate project site than shrimp that requires a relatively saline environment. On the operational side, the study proposes that a capacity of the corporation will have to be built from an organizational perspective, systems and retraining of employees, as well as recruiting appropriate skills and expertise for technical and operational management. Market opportunities for this venture are to a small extent local and regional. However, the main target market would be the United States of America. Godfrey Brooms MTV News Update. The Working People's Alliance believes that the list of nominees for the GCOM chairmanship presented by opposition leader Bart Jagdeo is one that is provocative. Here's Nickel John with this report. Executive member of the Working People's Alliance, Dr. David Hines, believes that the list of persons to be considered for the chairmanship of the Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM, should be impartial. The executive member says being a neutral person is the yardstick the party can work with. However, Dr. Hines added that the two lists which were submitted by opposition leader Bar Jagdio cannot work. Each of those lists has included some person or persons aligned to the PPP. And we feel that that is a non-starter. Dr. Hines says President David Granger 
has asked for persons on the list to be a judge among other criteria. However, the party does not consider those areas to be qualified for the position. He added that the party is concerned that the matter is being dragged out. Dr. Hans believes that President Granger should not fall trapped to the opposition's alleged strategy to induce him to unilaterally select a chairman. The PPP is playing politics. The PPP is playing politics with everything it does. And our view in the WPA is that the PPP is putting forward these lists in a very provocative way because they want to push the president to unilaterally appoint. They keep hammering at that. We are going to be opposed to him point. So what they're doing is that they are giving him lists that he would reject with the hope that he would appoint <coughs> a GCOM chairman on his own and then he would say, oh, so you see that is what we were saying all along. And so in that regard, we're in solidarity with the president in terms of not falling for the PPP's trap. President David Granger and opposition leader Bar Jagdio had met on two separate occasions after the list of nominees for the chairmanship of GCOM did not meet the criteria. The lists were rejected by President Granger. Currently, Jagdio is to present a third list for consideration. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The Public Accounts Committee on June 19 bashed governmental agencies as it has allegedly been proven that those agencies have time and again shown flagrant disregard for the recommendations given by the committee. Permanent Secretary of the Department of Culture, Youth and Sports, Melissa Tucker, along with her financial advisory team, were unable to give accurate answers on items housed at a synthetic track. This follows an appearance by the Department of Culture, Youth and Sports at the Parliament Accounts Committee on June 19. Member of the PAC, Vola Lawrence, called it a team as the previous recommendations, which have been given in 2015, have not been complied with. This, she says, has been a cause for contradictions and inaccurate answers given to the committee when questions were posed. That even after one year, no attempt was made to retrieve these logbooks and say, and ensure that we're following the recommendations of PAC, at least just to pretend. And this is what we've been seeing with all of the agencies coming before the Public Accounts Committee. Total disregard. On the other hand, Chairman of the PAC, Air Finale, questions why sanctions are not initiated by the Ministry of Finance following the disregard for recommendations. But this is something that we have to address. We're consistently issues raised in the AG report and issue raised by the PAC <coughs> keep reoccurring without seemingly any interest in correcting the situation. Meantime, Ministry of Finance Secretary Hector Botts committed to initiate discussions on a possible sanction at the upcoming Ministry of Finance meeting scheduled this week. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Shocking stats released by the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation reveals that 3% of Guyanese are living with anemia, also known as sickle cell. Fighting against sickle cell stigma faces is edifying and sensitizing the public about anemia in an effort to ensure sicklers are treated without bias and provided quality health care. Founder of FACES, Sabrina Kasim, advocates for a partnership to be developed to ensure a better quality life for sicklers. Pediatrician at the Georgian Public Hospital Corporation, Dr. Sherlyn Staten, says those aware of the disease should seek medical attention with urgency. Migrations and interracial marriages have been cited as a main spread of sickle cell as persons of African descent were the ones known to contain the disease. 3,000 babies are born annually in low- and middle-income countries with the disease, according to Staten. Whether you're a carrier or you're aware that you have a family member or a child who has sickle cell um, or thalassemia, that they enroll in a clinic that can actually monitor their disease and ensure that they can have a healthy life. According to Dr. Staten, 3% of Guyanese have been found to be carriers of the sickle cell. Additionally, some 106 persons were showing signs of the disease. Now, persons who have sickle cell disease have many symptoms of the disease, but not everybody experiences the very same symptoms. So, 
persons who have these very same genes may have severe to not so severe or mild symptoms. Sickle cell disease is a group of disorders that are affected with hemoglobin, the molecule of red blood cells that delivers oxygen throughout the body. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Nominations for the Ethic Relations Commission are presently being examined by the Parliamentary Committee of Appointment. The commission, which has been dormant for years, needs 10 persons. The People's Progressive Party has been a tone in the government's foot to reawaken the Ethnic Relations Commission from its slumber. Against this backdrop, the chairperson of the Parliamentary Committee of Appointment, Catherine Hughes, says the committee is at the stage where nominations are being documented. Hughes says the nominations are being collected from a number of non-governmental and civil organizations. She says the process has been a lengthy one as those institutions have been meeting only on a monthly basis. So we're moving as fast as possible to ensure we get the list of nominations for all the committees, the commissions that are outstanding. According to Hughes, the committee is responsible for writing those organizations that will be tasked with submitting a nominee for the commission. After finalizing the nominees, the committee will submit the names in a motion to the National Assembly for approval. The commission initially comprised of seven representatives, but in 2015, it was increased to 10. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Intense rainfall and clogged canals have left cash crop farmers in Region 3 counting millions in losses. Acres of farmlands under cultivation have been inundated. News Update paid a visit to Bell West, Canal No. 2 in Region 3, and heard the cries of the farmers. The farmers are counting millions in losses, as floodwaters have in some cases totally submerged their cash crops. In the area which consists mainly of farmers, planting suckers, cassava, pumpkin, callaloo amongst other plants are being totally wiped out. Some farmers are building a mud barricade around their entire farmlands, but as the water raises, the lands are inches away from being totally washed out. Right now, millions of dollars planting, cherry, uh, avocado, everything. You can see the farm, I did 40 acres right now. And I, got, I, I, I don't want two drum diesel. Every night this pump, got, this tractor got to work in, right? To, to release water, but I can't manage now because the, the water outside building up more high. It look like this, you got to drink oil in this country because they focus on oil, right? They focus on food. And you eventually you're going to see people starving in this country. They go up in the neighbor eventually. Spend a lot of money farming, fertilizer, labor, and everything on the water. And you can see like you know, the done to farm or cash with an oil. The government is being called on with immediacy to tackle the situation as a number of families depend on farming for survival. Godfrey Brooms, MTV. News update. The recent heavy rains have caused concerns for some citizens in certain low-lying areas in Georgetown. The mayor and city council has assured citizens that all pumps and sluices are in working condition to drain the city. The mayor and city council along with their city engineers are vigorously addressing the issue of drainage in the city. City engineer Culvern Venture said that men are on the ground constantly throughout the day to supervise the drains, pumps and sluices as the May-June rainy season continues. City engineer Culvern Venture also mentioned that $240 million have been budgeted for drainage issues in the city. As it relates to drainage in the city, um, this, the council is um, vigorously addressing those issues, um, taking into consideration the rainfalls that we are having um, over the past weeks. Um, what the department is currently engaging, we have men on the ground 24-7 uh, dealing with uh, clearing of chokes, clearing of blockages, um, even clearing some of the waterways such as the drains and so that are heavily vegetated. Um, so that these waters could quickly reach to the sluices and pumps so they could be discharged as quickly as possible. City engineer Culvern Venture said that certain areas in Georgetown have been affected by floods over a period of time and the council has acknowledged the issue. Yeah, there are other critical areas um, 
One of such is the Alexander uh, village. Um, that in itself, that's, those are very low line areas. Um, you have east and west rock belt. Um, well, that would be as a result also of, is, is a low line area, but also the canal which runs along there. You have Camelville, uh, some sections of Queenstown and so forth. Those are areas, but what we find, um, those areas are quickly, the water quickly recede from those areas because you have the, the, the waterway free and you're able to maintain that regularly. But on the south of most of the challenges is on the south of the city where you have the encumbrances of the, uh, along the uh, drainage reserves. And as such, um, it, it is kind of challenging for the, 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 the city engineers department or the council to, to um, look to address these things quickly as possible. The town clerk of Georgetown, Royston King, also praised the persons who resisted the urge to litter the city, which has brought some ease to the flooding issue. We also wish to uh, commend citizens for their uh, discipline, particularly in certain areas. In the central business district, we've been having uh, modest success in terms of people resisting the temptation of littering. Uh, we, you notice even when we have overtopping in certain areas that you don't see uh, garbage floating in the, in, the, uh, in the storm water, but what you actually see is clear water. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Monday, June 26 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Trish Ramlal, thanking you for watching.